right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's basic Hebrew lesson on this 11th day of September 2022. When we met last week, we were starting to talk about Hebrew verbs. And we had discussed a little bit that uh, Hebrew verbs uh, function a little bit differently than English verbs, whereas English verbs especially focus on tense, voice, mood, person, and number. Hebrew verbs have a, a set of different components involved. So, for instance, when we're looking at the components of Hebrew verbs, we are especially interested in noting the stem of the action. And the stem, of course, is referring to the type of action. As we saw last week, there are seven different Hebrew stems, different Hebrew um, types of action. And so we have, for instance, the cal, which is the basic action, the nifal, which is the passive of the cal, meaning that the subject is receiving instead of doing the action. So good distinction then between the cal and the nifal then. Cal, basic action, I walked the dog. Nifal, the passive of the cal, so passive of that basic action, the dog was walked by me. Then we come on down to the PL, intensive action. So in this particular instance, we're taking that basic action that we saw up above and we are going to be intensifying it in some way. As we indicated last week, there are different ways of intensifying an action. I can, I can intensify an action in terms of degree. So thus, I may have a basic knock, but then I can have a louder and thus more intensive knock. So the second would, of course, be the more intense there. Then I can also intensify an action by repeating it. So that would be more intense than just simple knock. And then I can also intensify an action by deliberately performing that action as well. So thus, PL, intensive action, and then the PUAL is the passive of the PL. HIFIL, causative action, I cause an action to happen. HOFAL, passive of the HIFIL and hithpa'el, which is referring to the reflexive action, that is the subject is both the doing and receiving the action. Then we had also talked as well about the fact that uh, Hebrew verbs will have aspects as well. Aspect refers to the completeness of the action. So thus we might have a perfect action aspect that is completed action and the imperfect aspect which refers to incomplete action action that is still ongoing or action that will take place and thus has not been completed yet person referring to the person of the subject whether or not the um, the subject is first person i second person you third person, he, she, or it. Then also gender referring to the gender of the noun that is serving as the subject, whether that subject is a masculine word or a feminine word, more on that a little bit later. And then also number referring to the number of the subject, whether you have uh, a single entity doing the action or more than one entity doing the action, so singular or plural. So these are then the components of Hebrew verbs, stem, aspect, person, gender, and number. And that is what we're going to be looking at when we take a look at uh, Hebrew verbs and we're wanting to find out what exactly it is doing in um, the clause. Now, another thing at this particular point that I would like to bring up here, 
So we had also taken a look a little bit at the paradigm for the Cal perfect and the Cal imperfect. So the Cal, that's basic action, perfect, completed action. And then over here we have the imperfect, which will be incomplete action. One of the things that you will notice as we are taking a look at this especially is that the forms of the Cal perfect and the Cal imperfect change according to the identity of the subject of the verb. So thus, if I have a subject that is third masculine singular, he, then I'm going to have underneath the first letter of the verb that comates, and then underneath the second letter, I'm going to have the pathak. But then when we come to the third feminine singular, now we're no longer having a verb that is pointed with a, a. Instead, what I have in this instance is the pointing a, a, a. So we have that method holding the first syllable open, vocal schwa with that a ending there. And so that is how that verb is going to be formed. Second masculine singular. Again, I'm going to have the, uh, the form a, a, ta here. And so thus, in this instance, this would be the form that the second masculine singular, so a U that happens to be a masculine noun, would be that form a at all. Second feminine singular, a at. First common singular, a at -y. Third common plural, a u. Second masculine plural, I a tem. Second feminine plural, Aten, and then first common plural, anu, there. And so those are going to be the forms. You notice especially that the pronouns for the subject, for the Cal perfect, in essence, they are at the end of the verb. They're attached to the end of the verb. When we come over to the Cal imperfect, however, it's a little bit different. The forms of the verb do not change so much at the end of the verb, but rather at the beginning of the verb. So, and this is why you will hear me talk about imperfect preformatives. That is those letters that are attached to the front of a verb to indicate that it is an imperfect. And the letters that are attached to the front will also tell me a little something about the subject. So you will notice that for the Cal imperfect, we have a total of four letters that are attached to the front of the verb. We have the yod, the tau, the aleph, and the noon. So for this, I like to use the mnemonic device, athon. So aleph, yod, tau, and noon. And this provides a, a good mnemonic device for working through these imperfect performatives. The olive, you'll notice that the olive only occurs one time on our list, and that is with the first common singular. So first common singular here. The noon also only occurs one time on our list, and that is going to be the first common plural. The yod occurs twice on our list, third masculine singular, and then also third masculine plural. And then the tau goes with everything else. And so thus that would be the second masculine singular and plural, the second feminine singular and plural, and then also the third feminine singular and plural. So basically, if you capture this, uh, this picture in your mind, it will help you to uh, identify the subject of 
the verb that you're dealing with when it is in the imperfect aspect. So a thon, you have the first commons on either side and then everything else in between. So the olive signifies first common singular, the noon signifies first common plural, the oath signifies third masculine singular and plural, and the tal signifies second masculine singular and plural, second feminine singular and plural, and third feminine singular and plural. And so more specifically then, the forms of those verbs that we're looking at, cal imperfect, third masculine singular, yo, teo, teo, tii, eo, yeu, teona, tiu, teona, and neo. So those are the pointing. And then as you can see, if we come on over here, uh, you'll actually be able to see that on a on an actual verb here. So here we have katal, he killed, katala, she killed, katalta, you killed, katalta, which would be a uh, you feminine singular killed. So and then we have katalti, I killed, katlu, they killed, kataltem, you plural killed. Kataltan, you plural killed, and then katalnu, we killed. And so you can see what has happened here. We have the same triliteral root throughout all of these forms, the kof, teth, and lameth. So that form remains the same, and that carries the meaning of the verb, in this case, kill. And then the pointing that occurs with the verb tells me the person, gender, and number of the subject. And same thing here when we come on down to the imperfect. Yiktol, he will kill. Tiktol, she will kill. Tiktol, you will kill. And then we have tiktli, you will kill. Ektol, I will kill. Yiktolu, they will kill. Tiktolna, they will kill. Tiktolu, you will kill. And that's the plural there. Tiktolna, you will kill. And niktol, we will kill. So again, as we go through this, we have that same triliteral root for the verb, the koth, teth, lameth, which carries the meaning of the verb. That is that idea of kill. And then the imperfect performative and the other pointing tells me the nature of the subject, if it's third masculine, singular, second, first, and all of that. So that is what we're looking at here in that. This now means that we have uh, enough to go on to take a look at uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 5 here. Last week, when we were taking a look at Genesis 1 through 5, we had identified the verbs in the English text. And so we had seen created, was, was, moved, let be, was, saw, was, divided, called, called, and were. So all of those are going to be verbs in the English text. And for most of these, there is a corresponding verb in the Hebrew text. Some of them, the KJV translators added um, the verb that is completely understood from the Hebrew, but is not explicitly stated. We'll look at that. So, for instance, here in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So, we've noticed that our verb here is, in fact, created. Well, in Genesis 1.1, you can see I've double underlined a particular word that is going to be the bath. Let's see if we can make that a little bit. There we go. So we have the bath pointed with the comates, resh pointed with the comates, and then the olive. And so this would then be the verb bara. Now, if I come on over here to this vocabulary list that I have, you'll be able to see that we do in fact have this verb bara as he created and as the dean indicated when he was walking through Genesis 1, 1 through 5, this idea of bara 
to create does not mean to uh, create out of nothing, but it means the idea of to bring something into existence that did not previously exist. So this is the word that we are looking at. Now, because it is a verb, that means I'm going to want to identify what were those components again. The stem, aspect, person, gender, and number. So now, so first of all, I want to identify the stem. Now, we've not talked yet about the diagnostics for the stems, but you already know them because you know the names of those stems. So we have those stems were again Cal, Nifal, Piel, Puel, Hifiel, Hophal, and Hifpael. So what the Hebrew grammarians did, they went ahead and they took a Hebrew verb, in this case, Pa'al, you can see the Pe, Ayan, and Lamed in all of these names here in the transliteration of the Hebrew. And then they went ahead and added the, um, the diagnostics of each stem to that particular verb to indicate this is how you identify the stem. So cal, the, the cal stem is also referred to as the pa'al stem. And as you can see, looking at this, there's nothing that has been added to the triliteral root. So thus, this particular uh, stem, it's clean. It's just the triliteral root with the appropriate pointing. The nifal, on the other hand, you can see that we have that root word again, the pe, ayan, and lameth, but to it has been added a noon there, a noon on the front. And this is one of those things that we look for when we're wanting to identify if we're dealing with a nifal. We look for the noon that has been added. The pe'el here. So the pe'el Notice that underneath the first root letter, we're going to have that hierarch. Underneath the second root letter is a sere. Now, another thing that is diagnostic that will help you to identify the PL and the PUL stems is that ordinarily there would be a dagesh forte in the middle root letter. So that dot that we were talking about a couple of weeks ago, that dogesh forte, which doubles the letter that it appears in. But you don't see that in the name P-A-L and P-U-A-L here because of the fact that these middle letters are ions and ions are gutturals. And that means then that these letters being gutturals, they cannot take the dagesh forte. And so for that reason, we do not have the dagesh forte in the name. But just remember, if you see a dagesh forte in the middle root letter of a verb, chances are good that you're dealing with either the peel or the puel stem. But notice as well the difference between the peel and the puel. Underneath the first root letter here for the name Pu'al, we have a kibbutz. U class of vowels, especially kibbutz, shuriks, have a tendency to indicate passivity. And that is exactly what this is indicating here. And so that is why we have that U class of vowel there on the Pu'al. The hifil, notice once again, we have that same triliteral root, but what has been added to it is the hey, and that hey is diagnostic for hifil uh, verbs. Hofal, again, you can see that you have that triliteral root, the pe, i, and lameth, but what has been added is the hey with a kamates hatuf here. So this is that kamates hatuf, that short o. And I know that because of the fact that we're dealing with a closed, unaccented syllable. So closed, unaccented syllables, short vowels. And then, hifpa'el. 
you can see once again we have that pei ayan lameth triliteral root and what has been added is a prefixed pith. So that gets us into the ballpark of what stem we're dealing with. And as you can see from our verb bara, we don't have a prefixed noon. We don't have a prefixed he. We don't have a prefixed tith. And we also do not have a dogesh forte in the middle root letter. This is just the triliteral root of the verb. In other words, this is the basic stem. So this is, again, going to be that So this is a cal here, basic stem. And now, so stem aspect. So now I'm wanting to identify if we're dealing with completed action or incomplete action. Now, if we're dealing with an imperfect, I would expect to see one of those imperfect performatives on the verb. And those four imperfect performatives were the aleph, yod, tau, and nun. I don't see any of those here. So thus, I know that this is going to be cal perfect. And then, now I'm wanting to identify the person, gender, and number of the verb. And that brings us back to our paradigm. So notice as we're dealing with this, we just have the triliteral root. Nothing has been added to the end. I don't have that a, ta, te, ti, u, tem, ten, nu. So this is just the triliteral root. That tells me this is third person masculine singular. And I know what you're wondering. You're wondering, wait a minute, the pointing for the Cal perfect third masculine singular is a, a, comates, pathak. This is comates, comates. That is correct. This is um, very often if you have a Cal perfect third masculine singular and the verb uh, of the triliteral root, the triliteral root ends with either a, an olive or a hay. It has a tendency to change, uh, the pathak has a tendency to change to the comate uh, under the influence of that olive and hay. Uh, so this is actually very regular for when we are dealing with a verb that ends with the olive. But it is a cal perfect third masculine singular from the verb bara. And so thus, third masculine singular, he, and then the verb bara, create. And then it's perfect, so completed action, roughly equivalent to the English past tense, he created. So that is that particular verb there. Then, uh, let's see, okay. Then if we come on down here a little bit further, next I have the verb hayatha. So this cor corresponds with our first verb of verse two, and the earth was without form. So hayatha, equivalent to that was roughly. This here is actually going to be from the verb haya. So again, this is going to be from the verb, oops. Haya, which is, if we were to come on over to our vocabulary list here, you would see this would be, in fact, the idea of, yeah, there it is, Haya, he existed. So again, as I look at this, I can see the correspondence between the he, the yod, and the he here. Uh, the tau here corresponds with the he. It's, um, there's a little bit of a relationship between those two letters. And so thus, this is the triliteral root. Nothing has been added to it, as in we don't have the hay of the hithiel, the noon of the nithal, the hith of the hith pa'el, and I also do not have a dagash forte in the middle root letter. That is the yod here. So this then, our stem would again be that idea of the 
Cal. And I don't have any of the imperfect performatives, the Aleph Yoth Tau Noon on the front. So this is again, perfect. And then I see this ah ending. Well, that corresponds very nicely with this third feminine singular, ah. So that is exactly what this is. This is going to be that Cal perfect third feminine singular. So thus, she existed. So third feminine singular, she, the verb haya exist, and it's perfect, roughly equivalent to the English past tense existed. Now, this is a good point to bring something up about gender in Hebrew. In English, when we are dealing with gender, we have a tendency to think uh, male human being, female human being, or male animal, female animal. Hebrew is not dealing with, gender in Hebrew does not refer to um, biological gender like gender in English does. Instead, what it refers to is the pattern of endings that a particular noun follows. And in this instance, the subject over here, Eretz, which is earth, is a feminine noun because of the fact that it follows the feminine pattern of noun endings, and we'll go over those endings here in a few weeks. But just bear that in mind, when we're talking about gender in Hebrew, we're not talking about biological gender, we're talking about grammatical gender, that is the pattern of endings that a particular noun follows. So that is haya there. And then, now, coming on down, so we have another verb in verse two in the English text, was here. But you'll notice that that particular word is italicized in English, which means that the KJV translators went ahead and put it in there for the ease of English speakers. Now the was is perfectly understood in the Hebrew text. Hebrew, uh, like other languages, has a tendency to elide verbs of existence, being verbs, when they are perfectly understood. And so that is what has happened there. And then we come to this word here, moved. The KJV translators translated this as a finite verb, but you will notice when we're looking at this particular word here, mirachefeth, so let's see, we said that most Hebrew words are built off of three letters. This one has a total of five, so something has been added. So rachaf, this is going to be the root, and then we have a mem added to the front. Now, when we were talking about the verb diagnostics, I did not talk about a mem being added. That is because for finite verbs, Mems are not added to verbs. This here is actually what we would call a participle, and I'm just introducing this term here at this point. But it's not a finite verb in the Hebrew text. It's actually a descriptive term. It's a verb that is being used as an adjective. And the mem here, especially pointed with this vocal schwa, is indicative of the peel stem that is intensive action so this here then this is a peel intensive action that is describing what the spirit of god was doing and the verb rachaf this is back and forth motion but you add the peel to it and now it is intensive back and forth motion. So thus, in that way, that's why we would say imparting intensive
back and forth motion. This is an illustration of why it is important to know the different stems in Hebrew because knowing the different stems, it has an effect on the way that the text is understood. It is because of this peel that when we were walking through Genesis 1, 1 through 5 with the Dean, he pointed out that the Spirit of God was imparting those vibrations upon the basic particles of matter because vibration is that intensive back and forth motion. So the peel does, in fact, uh, it is very significant here in this particular context. And, um, Okay, I don't want to go any further into verb full into the uh, the other verbs here in Genesis uh, one one through five at this point, but um, and Dr. Sheets, did you want to uh, bring up uh, that one illustration that you had mentioned to me about the significance of the um, the perfect and the imperfect? Were you wanting to do that at this point, sir? I thought I clicked it. Oh. Looks like you froze there. Okay. Are you there, sir? Okay. Looks like uh, he's frozen uh, a moment there. That's all right. But um, basically, the uh, the little um, illustration that the dean was sharing with me before class, there was a uh, a missionary that um, the dean had uh, been explaining the significance of the imperfect and the perfect aspect too, and. This particular missionary met a Jew, and um, and so he and the Jew were talking, and the missionary said to him, do you realize that when God said to Israel that uh, he gave the land of Israel to the nation, that he used the perfect aspect? That is, he has given, the land has already been given to Israel. It's complete, not incomplete action. Can and you hear me now? I can hear you, yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> can, do you have, I don't know what happened. A, a pop-up came on the side of my screen and okay. froze everything, so I had to go out and come back in. Oh, but, sure. Uh, can you, do you have your Bible works open? I do not, but I can pull it open real quick here. Okay. And then go to Genesis 15, 18. All right. <clears throat> Genesis 15, 18. So this is after the God made the covenant with Abraham, and Abraham believed in the Lord, and he, and he thought for him righteous. And then uh, if you go to 15, 18, um, and you can see in 15, 18, where this is where the Lord said, uh, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying unto thy seed. And you notice the wording, have I given this land? 
that that in the text that have I given and it's up there and you could you could point that out if you want to not that T yes it is a it is a cow perfect and as I was sharing with I've shared with others before um, some some a few years back I was talking to a man who was a missionary in uh, Thailand and uh, I think we've been communicating by email and such and uh, so he said something to me about this <clears throat> and I told him about this point that that in Genesis 15 18 God did not say I will give this land to your you and your seed he didn't say I will give he said in this verse in particular he says if you will it's a cow perfect and it's I either you could say I gave or I have given but what it's signifying is that the act of giving was already completed in the eyes of God and regardless of what humans thought and that's one of the things why the Israelites who know the scriptures, they have an idea that this is our land. God gave it to us and it can't be given to anyone else because God never changes. He never violates. He never goes back on his word in any way. So this, this missionary told me he, he took that information and uh, was thinking about it. And then he was riding a bus in Thailand and he was sitting beside a man who was a Jew and they were talking and the subject of the land of Israel came up and the Jew was of the persuasion that the land did not actually belong to Israel. They just possessed it by their power and all these, these political intrigues and so forth. And so the missionary took what I had shared to him that, in this verse, God said, I have given, and, and that is a cow perfect. It's a completed action. And, and God is the one who said this. And when he shared it with the Jew, the Jew was amazed. He said he had never seen that before. And he was amazed and was, uh, let's just say he was edified by the fact that this uh, Christian, Gentile had clarified the Hebrew scriptures for the person who's supposed to know his scriptures and didn't. <laughs> but it's kind of interesting that that God actually said, I have given. And it's it's a cow perfect of the verb nathan, which is the verb to give. So hmm. very, very and there are other places where you, God uses when he says, of the covenant that he made with Abraham and Abraham's seed, he said, I will give, I will. So he used imperfect in that place. I think that's over in about 17, Genesis 17, but I don't recall. But the, the aspect of the verb, whether perfect, imperfect, or even the participle that she just introduced is very, very significant. So it's, it's what God wrote. And if God didn't write it, then man did. And if man wrote it, then who cares? We'll all go out and get us a job somewhere, selling insurance maybe. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions before we conclude our basic Hebrew portion of this afternoon? All right. Very good. I will go ahead and stop our recording and we'll take a little bit of a break and then come back and get into Genesis.